Assalamu alaikum, everybody. Nothing says, Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah. Nothing says uh, college campus masjid like a uh, binder clip, <laughs> microphone clip, mashallah. <laughs> like, literally. <coughs> He's like, I need that back afterwards for my notes, please. Uh, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al anbiya wa al-Muslimin, Sayyidina Muhammad, <laughs> sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How's everybody doing? Alhamdulillah. This is like one of those this is like one of those mind tricks where they're like, just imagine you're warm. Just think you're warm. And you'll be warm. Uh, so I wanted to, to first and foremost thank everybody for um, coming out tonight. MashaAllah. Uh, you know, Austin never disappoints. This is actually my first time, but I've heard a lot from Sheikh Abdul Nasser and others that MashaAllah, you guys keep it really lit. No pun intended. Uh, <laughs> you guys keep really lit, MashaAllah, here. And I just ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless this gathering. And I ask that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless everybody here. And that Allah ta'ala give everybody here nothing but goodness. And that he untangle the webs that we put ourselves in sometimes. And that he give us the courage to overcome our, our struggles. And the strength to be patient throughout our difficulties. Amin ya rabbil alameen. So, um, first I, I want to introduce... Uh, the, the Bengali version of me sitting next to me. No, I'm joking. Um, this is Ustad Safi. He's our new chaplain and teacher for teens at Roots, alhamdulillah, in Dallas. And he'll be, inshallah, on the rotation to visit Austin uh, once every so often, um, along with Sheikh Mikail, Mufti Muntasr, and others, inshallah. And so we're going to be doing my se the sessions that I have, we're going to be doing them together, inshallah, um, today and also tomorrow. And uh, we decided to talk a little bit, or tonight we were talking about this topic of socializing and the idea of what something is when it's a sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam, And how Islam is so beautiful, alhamdulillah, in that, number one, it is a religion that is built upon the foundation of communal interaction. That things like this tonight make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy. This is something that would make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy. This is something that the Prophet sallallahu would see and he would actually become overjoyed when he saw his companions and the believers getting together and sitting and not only sitting in gatherings of knowledge but just gatherings of companionship. And there are narrations where the Prophet sallallahu would actually, despite being very tired, and probably many of us can like attest to this sort of, despite being very tired, he himself, Ayy sallallahu would come outside and would get around the campfire. And he would, the, the, the companions that were with him would describe him being noticeably tired. Meaning that like they would notice that he was kind of leaning on his hip, leaning on his side a little bit. Maybe he had something to put his hand on. And these are all signs obviously of like someone who wants to just go sit down or lay down. But because the conversation was so nice, and because the company was so nice, the Prophet ﷺ didn't want to go to bed. He didn't want to leave the gathering, basically. And so this is our understanding that as Muslims, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran over and over again that we are from al ladina amanu, all of those who believe. And this is like a reminder to us that like being part of a jama'ah is an important thing. That if you ever feel the, if you ever feel like, if you ever lose the, the motivation to be with people, then as we all do, anyone here ever need like a hiatus day or a couple days or a week? Sometimes like you over socialize, like you burn yourself out. But if you ever find yourself not wanting to be part of a group or a, a, a community in general, then this is something that we have to remedy. And this is why even like Roots exists, is to build a space of community. I know a lot of us, especially those of you who haven't been, think it's just about coffee, uh, which partially it is because coffee brings people together. But in reality, Islam is built upon this idea of bringing people together, hearts together. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to unite our hearts. So this is something that's like really, really important. And this is why scholars have taken like time to write advices in books on what it means to be a good friend. Because at the core of gatherings like this, at the core of all of this is our relationships between individuals. How many of you came here tonight with somebody else? 
not like that with somebody, but like you came here like with somebody, right? Like it was like the two of you who are Nick and that's it, right? No, I'm just joking, right? No one else is going to admit it. I know. Uh, no, but generally you come here, like I even just saw like four or five people. I saw, you know, Hanin come here with some friends. I saw, you know, uh, mashallah, the Dallas homies rolled through together. This is part of what is bringing us together, right? And so this is something that we have to do is that we have to, number one, admit that this is part of our faith. But also, as with anything, there are certain like adab or etiquettes, like how to do something. Because Islam beautifully doesn't just give us the goal, but it gives us the method. Like it doesn't just tell us that Jannah exists, it tells us how to get there. Right? Because one of the most difficult things is when somebody tells you to do something, it doesn't give you instructions. And so when we look at the life of the Prophet Sallallahu and this is why this whole title, I gave this talk, by the way, in Oxford, like in 2014, I think that's where y'all got the title from, no? Okay, that was awkward. Uh, okay, <laughs> you definitely got it from there. Anyway, so, so, but the point being is that when, when, when we talked about this talk before, when I gave it before, the idea was that the Prophet Sallallahu was a role model for all things, for everything. And there are some narrations that, because we've learned about the Prophet Sallallahu as like a lawgiver, as like a legal, judicial powerhouse, which he was, or as a master general, which he was, or as a statesman, which he was, or as a theologian, which he was, sometimes all of those things get in the way of us seeing him as a father, a son, a friend, and someone who also had to negotiate people who didn't like him. And that's something that we also don't want to talk about a lot, which is that you're not going to be liked by everybody all the time. And so how did the Prophet Sallallahu teach us how to manage that? Because that can be a very stressful realization. And so when we come to this understanding that Islam teaches us this, it puts us at rest. It makes us feel comfortable. Okay, so tonight our goal, inshallah, is to share some stories and pull some, harvest some reflections from how the Prophet Sallallahu was as a, as a family member and as a friend, and as a, com as a community member and as a companion. The first story that I want to share is actually one that's probably one of my favorites, and then I'll hand it off to Ustaz Safi, he's going to share a couple, and then I'll finish it up with a couple, and then we'll open it up for Q&A, because I don't want to do too long of a lecture. I know it's been a long day for everybody, and you have to get up early tomorrow. 10 a.m. for college students is like sunrise, right? <laughs> so you have to get up early, um, especially if you're going to, mashallah, you know, apply the, the contour and the highlight, inshallah. <laughs> <laughs> don't forget this. Don't forget the set spray. Okay, so <laughs> I know way too much about this. My feet are warm now. Okay, put my feet near the candles. I know they're lights. I know. Uh, so one of the stories that is really remarkable about the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and uh, I'm guessing most people are here without their parents. I'm guessing. There's a few of you who are. If you are, you can just not, uh, don't, you know, just blink twice when I ask questions, <laughs> right? Blink three times if you need help. So, um, one of the most beautiful things about the Prophet Sallallahu is that he, Aisha Sallallahu was born, um, his father had passed away before he was born. And his, uh, his mother passed away shortly after, early on in his life. And one of the things that we tend to fail to realize is that number one, this is from the get-go, it is a symbol that Islam is going to be uh, an environment, it's gonna be possible in environments that are very difficult. Some of us start to resent religion or faith because we feel like we're being tested. And that's a very natural human response. The Prophet ﷺ said that Kad al Fakru and Yakunu Kufra that poverty can push someone to the brink of disbelief. So the Prophet ﷺ himself said that difficulties can cause someone to lose faith in God. That is a reality of difficulty. But at the same time, if a person can withstand whatever Allah is putting them through, then Imam Ghazali and others, when they talk about the virtue of sabr, what they say is that the reward that a person experiences throughout the difficulty that they fight through, the reward at the end when they've climbed that mountain, it is greater than any of the challenge that they were put through. In fact, they will look at the challenge and they will say, it was so worth it a thousand times over. Like when you climb a mountain and at the top you see a beautiful view that you wouldn't have seen from the base of the mountain 
as difficult as it was and as many times you regretted it, right, a quarter, halfway, and three quarters of the way up, when you get to the top and you're able to take in that view, it completely changes your perspective on the experience. So the Prophet Sallallahu being born into this situation, there's no doubt. And this is, by the way, something that like, people are like, oh, religion's not relevant to me. Like the Prophet Sallallahu was raised by a single mother, right? And then on top of that, she passed away and he was raised by his extended family. I mean, this is, if you're talking about a religion that is not built around elitism or social elitism or like, you know, exclusive kind of like social or family situations, it's Islam. Like, look at the Prophet Sallallahu being raised by his mother and then his grandfather and then his uncle and basically being taken on by, raised by a village, right? So, but nevertheless, the Prophet Sallallahu how old was he when his mother passed away? Who knows? Six. He was six years old. Do you guys know like six years old? Anyone here ever had an interaction with a six-year-old? The best. Wow, mashallah. All right. Do you babysit? <laughs> Let me get your number, mashallah, four years, okay? So six years old. Now, do any of you like have a ton of memories from before the age of six? You might have like a few. In fact, some, some theorists on like in memory formation say that it doesn't really completely exist. And even if it does, it's like kind of very, you know, it's sparse and inaccurate. But the point I'm trying to make is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi passed away before he had been able to accumulate a lot of memories with his mom. And I know a lot of us, you know, there's times when I say the word mom or mother, you're like, oh man, I got, you know, a lot of stress might come to the brain or to the heart. But think about it this way. Think about it. Try to think about right now your, your parents without any of the drama or baggage that you've had, right? So he didn't have time to establish those memories with his mom. He didn't, ha he didn't have the recollection of those memories with his mother. So if we were to speak from a purely empirical or material sense, beside the fact that she gave birth to him and nurtured him for the first few, for the first few years, but even then he was raised right as a foster son to Halima Saadiya and her husband, radiallahu anha, he didn't have that much time with her. But now, let's fast forward about 45 years. And we have a small city outside of the city of Medina, the city called Abwa. And this city is only significant in Islamic history because it is where Amina is buried. Because she passed away when she was coming back from visiting her family in Qulba and Medina with the Prophet ﷺ when he was young. So he, she passes away suddenly and he comes back to Mecca and he grows up his entire life. He grows up in Mecca. And then after he moves to Medina and they make Hijra, he's with his companions one day and they're traveling. This is like 45, 50 years after his mother passed away. And remember, he doesn't have a ton of memories of his mother. So they're set out and they're camping one night. And as was the usual, they would go to the Prophet Sallallahu around Tahajjud time, right? Let's say Fajr comes in at five, they would go to him at like three, right? Last third of the night. And they would go and they would, you know, seek for his leadership in Qiyam al-Layl. So they would say, like, can you lead for us? Oh, can everyone move up, inshallah, just make some space, inshallah, for those, <coughs> if you have any space in front of you. So they would go and they would try to find the tent of the Prophet Sallallahu to have him lead them in Qiyam al-Layl. So they went to his tent. We'll wait till everybody finishes moving up, inshallah. It's okay. Oh, that tea is hot. It's just hot water, actually. Uh, it's hot. Okay, are we good? All right, bismillah. Okay. So, so they're camping. They're, they're on a journey on a caravan, and they, they, take, they set up their tents one night at Abwa. And they, uh, subhanAllah, they go try to find the Prophet Sallallahu for Qiyam al-Layl. And they go to his tent, and they find that he's not there. So the companions become worried because obviously the Prophet Sallallahu in some circles is a wanted man. He's somebody who is, you know, the, obviously there's enemies. There's people who want to take the Muslim community down. They want to take them out. Um, there's, always been, there's always been Tommy Larens forever. Um, and so they kind of, they're, they're, they're spewing hate about the Prophet Sallallahu So he's potentially always, you know, very uh, at risk. So they become very concerned. They become worried. So they start to look around for the Prophet and they walk around and they, at a nearby distance, 
see like the figure or the silhouette of a person kneeling on the ground. They walk over and they see that's the Prophet Sallallahu and they hear him weeping. And it was customary for the Prophet Sallallahu to be very emotional during his prayer. So they thought maybe perhaps he was got started early on Tahajjud. But then they noticed that he was kneeling and there was something, you know, some sort of like designated, not a tombstone, but a designation in front of him. And obviously it was not facing towards the Qibla the way he was kneeling. And they realized that this was the grave of his mother. And he was kneeling <coughs> and he was shedding tears over a mother that he had very little memory of. And why is this so significant? Well, number one, it shows you how human he was. He missed his mom, right? Like, I remember when I, when I finally left home, it was like the greatest day of my life, right? No more curfew, no more, you know, nothing. I can do what I want. I remember distinctly, I, I'll never forget this, the first night that I had my own place and my friends left because they helped move me in, I was crying on the floor of my apartment, like a baby, like a giant Hagrid-sized child. <laughs> <laughs> and at the time, I had, my wife and I had, had had our nikah done for a couple of years, so I called her, like how I slipped, I slipped that in there, right? <laughs> I called her because, right? Shout out to Amin and Arham. So, <laughs> I called her and I remember like I was on the floor of my apartment empty nothing there except for like a couch and a TV and I was just crying telling her I miss my mom you know no offense to any dads I'm a dad right and she's like I literally she's like I could I can't understand you what are you crying about and I was like I just miss my mom right and my mom and I by the way like like you would not believe you would not believe how much my mom and I like butted heads like, like, I can't even tell you all the stories because you just wouldn't listen to me anymore, right? You'd be like, this guy's worse than I am. Like, you know, like, <laughs> you know, man, you did that. Like, maybe I can, you know, inshallah, you can be much better than me, right? You can be much better than I am ever. Say, I mean, Allah make everyone much better than me because I'm nothing. But the point being is that like, I went from like desperately wanting to leave home so badly, like so badly, right? To then being like, reduced to a puddle of tears uh tears and beard which is my first solo album name uh <laughs> on the floor of an apartment in dallas texas and it hit me at that point subhanallah like there are a few people in your life that will ever take the place that your heart has designated for them and one of them is your mother right your father your siblings of course you know you have special places in your heart that are designated so when you hear the story of the Prophet Sallallahu crying because he misses his mother, the heart that is alive feels a sense of shame, like, did I call my mom today? Because my Prophet Sallallahu like wishes that he could have spoken to his mother that day, right? And this is coming from, again, the socialization habits of the Prophet Sallallahu He never forgot his people. He never forgot his family. He didn't just say, you know what, my mother was buried there, let's keep going. He actually calculated a stop for his caravan to go there so that he could go and pay his respects to a woman that he had only six years with, right? And this is something to show us how important it is with how important it is to be with your family. Because oftentimes with family, we can take them for granted the most. And we can be more concerned about what our friends think of us or what you know, our social circle might think of us, more so than what our parents think of us or our siblings think of us, right? But the reality is that there is a huge responsibility that we have to the people that are in our lives, known as our family. Ustaz Safi is gonna share a couple more stories, inshallah, then I'll kind of wrap it up with a few more, and then we'll take questions, inshallah. You gotta kind of hold it close. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, salatu wassalam ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Assalamualaikum everybody. How's everyone doing? Good, alhamdulillah. So um, I really actually appreciate where South Africa actually started off from. Um, I think it's really important to actually highlight uh, the Prophet Sallallahu relationship with uh, his mother, even though he only knew her for six years of his life. Um, and it actually kind of begs to ask the question, he fell in love with his mother in six years, right? And he cried where she was buried, 
right? And it kind of makes you kind of just think, it, it, put, it kind of puts you in that position to see like how you would feel because we ourselves as human beings, we have this natural tendency to kind of take things for granted when we have them, correct? And you know, th what I'm gonna inshallah share with you guys really quickly is kind of a further testament to that, that principle. That, you know, as young people in the community, and by the way, I'm only 26, like I'm, I'm, I'm still humble, I'm pretty young. And um, so we unfortunately in our lives, we take for granted the people that sometimes mean most to us. Because when we're around them so often, that's just a, that's what the natural human heart does, right? We get used to things. If you have like you know the iPad Pro, and the new iPad Pro just came out, the old one with the old Apple Pencil seems old to you, right? Even though it's still like an amazing piece of machinery. He's talking about this because I just got the new one. <laughs> he did. I know. And he's like, "What's that pencil work?" I'm like, oh, man, chill out, right? Right, right, right. 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 You're like sneaking my sneaking my husband in there. <laughs> So, alhamdulillah, you know, it, it really reminded me of this second idea of, you know, the second part of the Prophet's life that was so important. And, you know, when he, alayhi salatu salam, he got married to Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha, right? Everyone knows Khadija, right? <laughs> Khadija, by the way, the Prophet salam, used to describe Khadija. He would say that her love nourished him. That's what he would say about her that her love, like the relationship that they shared, used to actually nourish him. It used to get him through the day. Could you imagine if someone spoke about you like that? You're like, no, right? <laughs> but like, that, that's what he said about her, okay? And by the way, that love was nourishing him because of a certain thing. It was because of the trust they had in the relationship. Because when the Prophet وسلم, he came running down from Ghar Hira, from the cave of Hira, right? And he went straight to her, okay? He went straight to her and he basically told her to cover him up because he was so frightened from what had just taken place just momentarily between him and Angel Jibril, we know. And he came down and he told her to cover him, cover me, cover me. And what was the first thing that she said to him? What was the first thing that she said to him? Does anybody know? Take care of the poor. Exactly. She started to compliment him immediately. Right? She didn't say, oh, you know, calm down. All right? Calm down right now. She literally said, you take care of the poor. You're an, uh, you're an amazing host. You cover for people who have less than you. She starts labeling and listing off these things that like, he does that have earned him the respect and the honor that he deserves. Okay, and you know, he said about her that she believed him. She was there for him when nobody else was, right? And there were so many things that like she did for him that nobody did for him before. And to the point where when she died, when she died, the Prophet said that year was known as the what? The year of? Year of sorrow, right? And when she died, it was so upsetting for him because obviously Abu Talib, his uncle, who took care of him for a large part of his life, he passed away later on. But when Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha died, he was so upset that he actually would stay in his house for a while. And there was a narration that actually said that an angel came down after she had passed away or soon when she was passing away. And he said to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam that you took care of her for so long now let Allah take care of her. That you took care of her for so long, now let Allah take care of her. That Allah is literally consoling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because when you, when, you, when you have a person who passed away in your life, it's a difficult situation, especially if you love them so dearly. But Allah is basically reinstating His comfort, right? He's saying that you took care of him, but you know that Allah can take care of anybody better than you could ever take care of them. So he's, so he's saying to the Prophet he says, let me take care of Khadija from now on, right? That was his relationship with Khadija. It was so beautiful. <coughs> and then you fast forward even more into his life and you realize how intimate his relationship with his family. There was actually a beautiful narration. I always kind of mention this every single time somebody ever asks about, you know, how the Prophet ﷺ was with people. There was a man that came up to the Prophet ﷺ, or the Prophet ﷺ's wife Aisha one time, right? And he asked her, right? If, for example, if you want to really know about somebody, you always ask their family members. Why? 
because they'll give you what? The cutthroat honest opinion, right? If you want to know about somebody, ask their brother, ask their mom, ask their sister. Dude, it's okay. To, it's, it's so easy to look, get in front of people you meet for 10 minutes during the day, right? But what about the people that like see you wake up with like drool on your face coming down with like your nasty pajamas to breakfast, right? Like those are the people that know you know you, right? And so, you know, this man, he went up to Aisha and he asked her, he goes, Ya Aisha, what was your husband? What was the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam like? What was he like? We just want to know what he was like. And Aisha's answer was amazing. And I want you guys to remember like the, the, the chronological format of the way she answered. She answers and she says, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, my husband, he used to spend his time by serving us, pointing to herself. Meaning what? He used to serve his family. He used to serve his family. And by the way, the Prophet Sallallahu was a busy guy. He wasn't just like some dude that worked at like FedEx from nine to five and came home and like demanded biryani. Like he was, he was a busy person, right? He was the Prophet of Allah. And she, Aisha, is saying that when he's home, he spends his time by serving us, by doing things for us. Can you imagine after like a hard day's work, what do we do when we see our family members? We're like, God, please get out of my way. <laughs> like, you're the last thing I want to see in my way between me and my MacBook and Netflix right now. Like, that's what he used to do during his time. And the second thing she says, like, then she, he used to spend his free time by praying to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And then the last thing I'll mention before I hand the mic back to Asad al Rahman is this beautiful narration of him and his grandsons. Okay? That when he was older and Hassan and Hussein, they used to play all the time on him, around him, while he was praying. He was making sujood, and the Prophet Sassam used to elongate his sujood so these kids could play. They would jump on top of his back and just kind of like go and play on him because all they saw, right, for, for an adult, what do they see? They see a man in sujood. They see a man saying, they're, they're, he's, he's in sujood to Allah, right? Subhanahu wa bil'ala. But to a kid, to his grandsons, all they see is like a giant horse, <laughs> right? All they see is a giant horse. They want to play on him. And he elongates his, his sujood. And there's another narration where he sees that the Prophet is kissing his grandkids. He's kissing them. Right? Showing affection. And then like a, and, and a Bedouin man comes up to the Prophet after seeing this. And he's like horrified, right? Like super macho Muslim dude. And he walks up to the Prophet and he says, Wallahi, I have ten sons and I have never kissed any of them. Like out of like kind of pride almost, right? And the Prophet Sassam, he looks at this guy and he goes, How do you expect me to understand you? When Allah has removed mercy from your heart. He goes, how do you expect me to understand you? Or get where you're coming from? When Allah has removed mercy from your heart. When there's no mercy in your heart. Which further proves the fact that the Prophet ﷺ was such a family-oriented person. I remember when we were in Sierra Intensive in 2017. Mubarak and Abu, right now. My, my, my dudes. When we were there, Shaykh al Nasr told us something profound. We were going through the chronological order of the Prophet's biography, and there was a moment in his life from age 25 to 35 when there was like very few narrations. There's a lot of narrations before, and a lot, a ton of narrations after. But Shaykh al Nasr was like, there is very few narrations in the books of Hadith of anything in his life from age 25 to 35. Why? Family. That's it. One word, family. He was busy being a father. He was busy being a husband. He was busy being a neighbor. He was just busy taking care of his folks. That's what he was doing. Which proves that, like, sometimes you just need to reel it in and just forget sometimes that, like, you know, like, social media exists and, like, you have to take a snapshot. You have to take a snap of, like, your quinoa, like, the next day and, like, all these, like, random things. Just pay attention to the people around you sometimes, the people that love you, that genuinely love you. Right? So the Prophet was first and foremost like a family man. He loved his family. All right? The Sadh Abdul Rahman, inshallah, will kind of wrap up, you know, the session of how the Prophet used to approach people. Um, so just to kind of just to kind of put it in a in summary, in Arabic they say like bit jumla. It's the reason why we're starting with family is this um, borderline obsession with the appearances that we carry of ourselves 
to the outside world without caring about those same appearances within the, the walls of our home. Like, and this is something of, of an issue that's becoming more and more prevalent that people will come and, and tell me and think, don't answer, don't raise your hand, but think to yourself, like, how many of you genuinely feel like someone in your family loves somebody else, like their friends, more than they love you? Or they would care about them more than they would care about you? Don't raise your hands, but think about that. And you know what's interesting is that maybe if, if, if you don't feel that way, then alhamdulillah, but the amount of, 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 of messages and the amount of interactions that I have where people say, my brother, I don't think my brother actually like cares if I die, right? And so when we talk about socializing like a sunnah, we would be bereft of any blessing if we talked about being a good friend before we talked about being good family. It would be pointless if all y'all left here like chummy chummy Venmoing each other love, right? <laughs> and like you went home and your mom was like, How are your, how's your day? And you're like, it's fine, right? We would be bereft of any barakah because we start with the foundation always, always. Right now, I'm not like I'm not yelling at everybody, <laughs> but I'm saying we all have to take this seriously. Me, inc myself included, myself included. Like I have to not, you know, feel anxious when I see my mother calling on my phone, right? Because there will come a day when I won't be able to talk to her, where I'll call and there won't be. I have a friend who still calls his mom's phone just to hear her voice in the voicemail. Her, his mother passed away. Allah These kinds of things they don't hit until they hit. So let's not be the person that waits. We ask Allah to help us. So that's why we started with family. But on top of that, and, and it was very profound what Ustaz Safi said, which is that like, if you want the dirt on somebody, just ask their family, right? And the Prophet's family never had anything negative to say about him. And also along with that, his close friends, the people that were closest to him. It tells you enough about him, the Prophet Wasallam. It tells you enough about him that from his wives, the people that he married, that two of his closest friends were blessed to have him marry their daughters, right? That it tells you enough about that Abu Bakr Siddiq and Umar bin Khattab, right? And then on top of that, Uthman bin Affan, his other, one of his other very close friends, married into his family. It tells you what kind of relationships they had as friends. I know for a lot of us, this seems kind of weird, right? Like, oh, but why would, I wouldn't want to marry my friend's brother. Like, that's strange, right? Then she becomes my sister-in-law and it's like, ugh, right? But the reality is that that is an indication of closeness and love. That is, that is next level. Absolutely. I'll tell you honestly, Safi is my brother-in-law, by the way, right? And when I used to visit Memphis to visit my in-laws, like, I would actually spend the night in his room like with him, right? And my wife was like, what? And I was like, we're together all the time, alhamdulillah, right? <laughs> but I only get to see Safi for two days. We need as much like, as much like goofing off and like laughing at Vine. That was back when Vine was a thing. Inna lillahi wa inna ilahi raji'un, right? <laughs> we ask Allah, yafta halayna al Vine, right? <laughs> to open upon us the Vine once more. Not even ever that, no. So we needed, we got some tears back there. I mean, right? <laughs> like, like, and that's, that's really one, and, and my sister-in-law, Tessine, some of y'all know from Dallas, like, we are very tight, right? And I will tell you that that's an aspiration that I didn't have necessarily going into marrying my wife, but I understood later the value of that friendship. I understood the value of that. That literally, like, like, my wife was supposed to come with me, but then the weather kind of went south, and with a kid, cold weather's not fun. So then we were like, yeah, let's just, me and Safi and I will just go. And she was like, are you sure? And I was like, yeah, we good, don't worry about it, right? <laughs> we are totally good, right? So having that as a standard, the Prophet ﷺ tells us that your friends, subhanAllah, like, you can be so close to them that you even desire for them to be family, right? And the Prophet ﷺ's relationship with his friends was profound, absolutely profound. They never had anything negative to say about him, Aisatussalam. They never had any criticism of him. They only talked about his character in the highest way. I mean, these are the kinds of people that when they were around each other, they always found him to be inspirational, but never condescending. They found him to be generous, but never patronizing. They found him to be loving, but never demanding. Like these are the traits of a friend that made him amazing. 
And when you see, subhanAllah, the Prophet Sallallahu and how he treated people, it inspires you to maybe think about your own relationships with your friends and how you can change. How are some ways that we can implement this? There's a few stories. The first is how the Prophet Sallallahu dealt with some of his friends, especially in managing what seemed to be like the best friend problem, okay? Which is what? Which one of my friends group is my best friend? Right? Back in, back in when I was younger, and, and the T-Mobile used to have a thing called like, what was it called? The Fab Five or something like that? Yeah. What was it? Yeah, yeah, Y'all know. Yeah, yeah. So I'm 30. I just turned 31 yesterday, so give me a break, right? Uh, thank you. I feel like I'm 50. Uh, I tell everybody this. Once you start getting excited that chicken goes on sale, you know that you're, you have to start putting in retirement. Like, so when I got chicken on sale, I was like, Allahu Akbar, right? <laughs> the Hedgewood works. So, <laughs> you laugh now. In 10 years, you'll be like, Sadaqa Abdurrahman, right? Like, he knew that man was so profound. <laughs> Forget the lectures. But, but, uh, what was I talking about again? Oh yeah, so they used to have the Fab Five. Back, back, like, and you used to be able to pick those people. And this is crazy, man. The world is changing so quickly. We don't realize. Those people wouldn't take from your minutes. And everyone now is like, what's that? Right? Because everyone's like unlimited, right? Nothing's unlimited, okay? It's a secular construct. Uh, okay? They wouldn't take from your minutes. Which was like a big deal because back in the day, you'd be paying like $70 for like 200 minutes. And nights and weekends, and nights were from like 11 p.m. to 1 a.m., right? So you like waited, okay? And your parents would track down like when you were talking the most because you only had a few hours and all that kind of stuff. I just kind of gave you all a little glimpse uh, into my life. <laughs> so the point being is that like it was always drama who was going to get in the Fab Five or the Top Five or whatever it's called. Who was going to get in? Fave Five, there you go, thank you. This guy's like, you're talking about the University of Michigan, right? Yeah, Fab Five. <laughs> okay, thank you. Fave Five, right? And it was always like drama too, like who's going to get in, right? And even now, subhanAllah, like now you translate this to, to, to your, your era, your, your era as if it was like the, your time. There are always those negotiations that people have to make, whether it's like inviting somebody for something or what kind of uh, relationship you have with somebody or what kind of secrets you might tell somebody. Like deciding basically who you're going to take as like your intimate close friend. And that's one of the signs, by the way, that you're a wise person is that you just don't talk to everybody. Right? Like you can't just share everything with everybody. You have to have those people that you keep tight and you keep close. And it doesn't mean that you hate everybody else, but it means that you know where the boundaries lie. Okay? Everyone right now is like mad paranoid. Don't, just don't think about it too hard. I was like, she left me on red yesterday. Am I out? Am I number six? So, so I want us to think about this. I want us to think about this concept as we think about the narration of the Prophet Sallallahu with Khalid, Khalid bin Walid, not Khalid, sorry, Amr bin As. And Amr, radiallahu anhu, was like convinced that he was like one of the Prophet Sallallahu favorite people. He was convinced. And he used to actually, he was so convinced that he used to brag about it to other people. So he used to walk around Medina and he was like, who's number two? <laughs> And they were like, what do you mean? He's like, on the list of Prophet Sallallahu favorite people. Because we all know who number one is, right? And he kind of had that sort of like, you know, he kind of had that swagger when he talked about his status. He thought that the Prophet Sallallahu genuinely loved him the most. And so one day the companions kind of felt a little bit, you know, a little bothered by it. And they used to get jealous, by the way. They used to get jealous. I'll tell you another story. So they used to get jealous. And so they decided to call his bluff on it. So they're like, okay, you think you're really the favorite for the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? He said, yeah. What do you mean, I think, dude? Like, I know. You wouldn't know. You're on the outside. We're on the inside. <laughs> so they were like, okay, go to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And why don't you just, why don't we just verify? Like, let's just verify. If, if you're so confident, is there going to be any harm in you asking in front of everybody? He's like, no, I'm good. So he goes up to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and says, Ya Rasulullah. Salaamu Alaikum, Ya Rasulullah. There was a question that some of the, our, 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 brother, our brothers, they had the question about what we have. And they wanted some clarification on what's between us, the close friendship that we have. Ya Rasulullah, who's your favorite person? Right? Kind of like armor on the shoulder. Like, who's your favorite person? Like, tell him, right? And the Prophet Sallallahu looks at him and he says, not, not condescending at all, nothing, just straight answer, Aisha. Like my wife. 
<laughs> Why, who's yours, right? <laughs> and I'm just like, yeah, 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 that makes sense. So if you read the narration, he continues. He goes, naam, naam, ya Rasulullah, naam, naam, yeah, of course, of course. He says, min rijal We all love our wives the most. We get, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. You might, I, might have, I might have phrased it incorrectly. From the man, right? And some of you are like, did he just assume his own gender? Yes, he did, okay? <laughs> From the man. And he goes, you know what he said? He said, Abuha, her father. He still talked about his favorite man through his favorite women. He didn't say Abu Bakr, he said, her father. He's my favorite guy. But it's it's because it's through her, right? Abuha. And Amr was like, I was so embarrassed. And then he said, so I asked, and then after. And he named somebody else. And he goes, and then after. And he named somebody else. He goes, I stopped asking after the third person. <laughs> but why is this story so powerful? It's powerful because Amr to so the Prophet Sallallahu was not number one or two or three or four or five, but he thought he was. And everybody in here knows that when you love somebody, when you love somebody, you give them some preference. You give them, look, everyone here is busy. You're students, you have a lot of responsibilities. And so giving your, your, your most valuable resource, which is your time, wal-asr, innal insana lafi khusr, your most valuable resource is your time. Allah says so. When you give your time to somebody, when you decide, I have three hours tonight to do things that I need to do. I'm going to give one hour or two hours or all three to this person or these people that I love. That is a statement. You are making a statement. When you choose to spend time with somebody over somebody else, you are making a statement. So in that way, we understand that the more you invest in somebody, that means that the closer that person is to you. Right? Part of the, re part of the way in which we know the closeness that people have with one another is how much time they spend with one another, right? Or let me translate this to y'all's language. Part of the way we know who is close with who is how much you gas each other up on Instagram comments. <laughs> and that's how much we know, okay? And we also know who's together through that. Okay, so <laughs> it's obvious. Y'all acting like you hiding. We know, right? <laughs> Man, y'all playing the game. We invented it, okay? So, <laughs> I'm like, oh, that move. Okay, that's classic, right? That's how you do it. Okay, right? So, so, back to the point, right? Back to the point. The Prophet Sallallahu the Prophet Sallallahu everyone just went, on, everyone just went on, on, on private right now. Everybody. <laughs> The Prophet ﷺ used to treat everybody with that level of focus and with that level of love and investment to the point where for him it was normal, but for them it was special. Because they were convinced that we were his favorite. How on earth would anyone treat me like this and I could not be their favorite? Well, the Prophet ﷺ was such a sincere socializer. Like he was so sincere. He didn't look at his phone, right? Hypothetically, when someone was talking to him, the hadith said that when I, when you spoke to the Prophet Sallallahu he would turn his entire body. I, I have teachers, subhanAllah, I had teachers in different places where I, I did a little bit of reading that they wouldn't even respond to your salam until they had turned their entire body to you, not their face, not their voice. They would not rely upon anything less than turning their entire countenance towards you when you talk to them. Why? Because this is an example of the Prophet ﷺ. Imagine how loved a person would feel if when you engaged with them, you gave them everything. Right? And, and, and this, is a, this is a really salient point because we are a generation that is being inundated with quantity over quality, but this is an example of where quality always destroys quantity. That if you give someone a minute of focus, it will take away 15 minutes of mistakes and repetition and trying to communicate something. This is the reality. Like, and this, by the way, when you want to have a successful marriage, when you want to have a successful family, when you want to be a successful parent, if, right, if and when, Allah give everybody what's best for them, I mean, right, and what they want. If you want this, you have to start now. Because the habits you build in these friendships, they don't just disappear when you find somebody. And the habits you build in friendships and marriage, they don't just disappear when you have kids, right? They get stronger. They become deeper rooted. They become firmer rooted. So the Prophet ﷺ had this with his friends. 
And along with his friends now, there were those of them who were not as close. But how did the Prophet Sallallahu treat like maybe community members, acquaintances? The Prophet Sallallahu would treat community members and acquaintances in a way that was always welcoming to them. It says enough about the Prophet Sallallahu that when people visited Medina to come and spend time with him and to meet him and become what's known as a Sahabi. Sahabi is somebody who saw the Prophet Sallallahu they, they, Alaihi they, they were Muslim when they met him and they were Muslim when they, or they were Muslim when they died. Okay, so they met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, they were Muslim when they met him, and they were Muslim when they died. People would come literally just to earn that distinction, that honor. I mean, imagine if someone told you the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is in Chicago. Like, you would be like, yes, I'm going to go meet the Ayatollah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Right? You're like, yeah. I mean, it tells you, it tells you enough that people do it now. We go to Medina. I was once on a plane going to Medina. There was a girl from Riyadh. She lives in Riyadh. And she was, on the, she was in the seat next to me. And she was like, where are you from? And I said, Chicago. And she was expecting, I think, like Istanbul or something, cause I, probably because I dress like this. And that was a long time ago. And she said, Chicago, like, like United States? And she was in Boston uh, doing some, some school work and stuff. So she was flying back to Riyadh. And she goes, what are you going, do you have like some work in Saudi? And I said, no, 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 I'm not really interested in Saudi Arabia. Uh, I'm interested in Mecca and Medina. And she said, you're going to Mecca and Medina? I go, yeah, I'm going for Umrah. She goes, you're going to Umrah from America? And you know, she said, subhanAllah, she said, why? I said, because it's Umrah. I said, it's the Prophet And she was dumbfounded. And again, not her fault. May Allah Ta'ala pardon all of us for our mistakes. She was dumbfounded that someone would spend thousands of dollars, take all their vacation and get on a plane and travel for two days or a day or whatnot and go just to make Umrah and just to go you know, just to go to Mecca, Medina and say salam to the Prophet Sallallahu But it says enough about how much we love the Prophet Sallallahu that like people go all the time. I had a person text me on the way, on the way here to Austin, this sister, she said, my family and I want to go for Hajj. We haven't prayed in years. We have not prayed. As a family, she said, none of us have really ever been praying and we've not prayed in years. SubhanAllah, we woke up one day with just this urge to go to Hajj. Do you think we can go? And she goes, we want to go with you. Basically, she was like, we saw you on YouTube. And I was like, may Allah forgive me, right? <laughs> She's like, we want to go with you. And I was like, Lord, I didn't even ask how they got my number. I was like, I figure at this point, it's just Angel Jabril or something, right? <laughs> and, but, but someone who, someone who they themselves said, I, do, I don't pray, but I want to go visit Allah's messenger. That's love, dude. That's love. And so the people in the time of the Prophet, them, they would come to visit. And you know what they would say? I'm not leaving. They would say, I'm not leaving. Happens today, by the way. They would go to Medina and they would say, I'm not leaving. And by the way, when you go to Medina, remember this, inshallah, may Allah invite us. You're going to have that thought. It's going to just run through your mind, even for a moment. What if, what if I just, because you're going to feel something there that you cannot feel here. No amount of Gordos. <laughs> no amount of torches queso, nothing can give you what you feel there. And you're going to have this fleeting thought. For those of you who've been, you know what I'm talking about. You're going to be like, what if I, what if I just, maybe we'd, they'd be down with it. Maybe a timeshare, right? Maybe I can go in on some people because of how much you love it. It's been happening since the time of the Prophet Sallallahu that people would come there and they would stay there because they loved him that much. And the last group I want to talk about is, so, so again, to tie that into like how we live today, ask yourself about the people who, who you have fleeting interactions with. The cashier at the grocery store, the waiter that served you food, the air host or hostess that gave you your one eighth of a can of Sprite over 19 ice cubes, right? <laughs> ask yourself, do these people, are they leaving this interaction wanting to get to know me more or happy that the interaction is over? And I've worked, by the way, retail. I've worked at many different retail stores growing up because, you know, a guy had to pay for tuition. There were the customers, you know, and retail itself is tough. May Allah Ta'ala help anyone who's working. It's difficult. You're literally in the souk, right? Yeah, you're in the souk, right? You're like in there. And you have those customers that you're like, I, I, I just don't know how anyone surrounds themselves with you. <laughs> and then you have those customers you have those customers where you're like, you, like, that was the most, that was the most pleasant two, uh, two minutes and 19 seconds that I've had all week was this interaction with you because of the way they approach you. How are you? How are you? How's everything? 
you, you look great today, right? Like the, again, these kinds of things, thank you for helping. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a nice day. Those kinds of things genuinely change. Today, it happened today at the grocery store. I was there with Musa and Musa picked up, uh, you know, the dividers between the groceries? You know that when you're on the grocery belt or the conveyor belt, you put the divider and that's like a signal. It's like an Ishada for the person behind you, like, go ahead, right? <laughs> but if you don't put it, you're like, wait, right? Tough, right? So, Saf, you got it. Okay, so we put one down and Musa picked it up, of course, because Musa's two years old and he's just like, I'll do what I want. You're in my world, right? <laughs> So we put another one and he started, he started playing like with a sword. Like he started doing the sword thing. And I was like, your mom's a hijabi. Like your dad's wearing like this Turkish imam thing. <laughs> and you're in the middle of South Lake, Texas, which is like MAGA country. And you're like waving a sword around. Like all I need for you now is be like, Allah Akbar, right? Like <laughs> all I need, right? Everyone's like, look what they teach their kids at home, right? And I'm not like, I'm not joking. You have these thoughts, right? So I'm sitting there and he's just like waving this thing around. He's like, shoo, 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 sword, shoo. <laughs> And you know, what the ca- you know what the cashier did? She was so sweet, subhanAllah. I made dua for her, actually. She, she looked at him, and oftentimes, like, people, especially who's busy, and it's kind of like an uppity grocery store, but we, we promised Musa after Jummah every week we'll go get him a cupcake. So we go there because I have a bakery. So we went there. It's all right, guys. It's all right, right? <laughs> That's how I got this big, right? My mom was like, cupcake every Jummah. <laughs> I went to both of us. <laughs> so... So... <laughs> so <laughs> so we're sitting there you gotta do what you gotta do so we're sitting there and the cashier normally like again up at the grocery store kind of like they'd be like uh sir please your son like please like and uh and she 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 picked she stopped and there was a line of people uh like probably donald rumsfeld's wife was in there somewhere and she picked up one and she started sword, sword fighting him for like a good 30 seconds. Like at one point I was like, do you do this? Like, are you, <laughs> are you a fencer? I know if he had, like we can set something up, right? And I thought to myself, like, that was the nicest thing. And you know what? Like, guess what's gonna happen? Next time I go and I see her in line, I'm gonna go there even with Musa or not, just so I can, like, just so I can like tell her like, that was one of the nicest things. Because parents of young children were always self-conscious that our children are like bothering people. And so not only did she take a moment that could have potentially been very, very embarrassing, but she actually embraced it and made it like a beautiful moment. This is how the Prophet ﷺ was. And this is a, 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 a person who's not Muslim, who's exemplifying his sunnah, that she was so loving towards children. And the Prophet ﷺ had this. This is, when, when we ask ourselves, when the Prophet ﷺ engaged with somebody, no matter how long that engagement was for, they fell in love with him. They, they just, they loved him. They couldn't explain it, right? And I know this is a really high bar to set because some days you just don't want to deal with it. You're just tired, you're exhausted. But maybe there's a way to find inspiration one day of the week, two days of the week, and then eventually grow to seven days of the week where you can tell yourself, let me be like the Prophet Sallallahu today. Let me give somebody an interaction that is going to allow them to see the beauty, not only in me, but in my faith, like what I represent, Right? And there's so many different ways to do this. But it, focus on the ways uh, that you would never think of. The interactions that are just very mundane and ordinary. Make them extraordinary. So the Prophet ﷺ, he had this kind of habit. Now what about people who like swore their enemyhood on him, like they didn't like him? The Prophet ﷺ, the way he treated people that wanted him, and this is very, very important for us, especially this demographic, especially us in the time that we're living in now. The Prophet ﷺ would never oppress any person, even if they had oppressed him. He would never exact his revenge upon somebody if, if there was no... The, the general rule was the Prophet ﷺ would never physically exact any retribution on somebody unless, unless there was some future tangible definitive concern that that person was going to do something extremely harmful to the community later. So the only time, for example, capital punishment was enacted or anything like that was enacted was when the person themselves, the person themselves was at risk to do it later, right? But the Prophet Sallallahu default was to forgive. His default was to forgive. In fact, when he found that certain companions didn't forgive and they would, they would continue to sort of like punish or take retribution on somebody, he would actually scold them. And there's narrations of this. Whether it was the person who committed zina 
the person who had uh, unlawful sexual intercourse, they, they fornicated, and they came to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and they were, you know, the, 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 the stoning was ordered for this person, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tried to give him a way out. He told him, like, were you temporarily, like, not conscious? Did something happen? Were you forced? Like, just give me something to hang on to that I can just say, ma'adhur, you're excused, right? That you and this woman had consensual sex, and I just want to make sure that I can kind of, you made your tawbah, just get out. Just, I don't want you to have to go through this, this, this punishment. And so the man said, I want to be given the punishment, like definitively, in a purely clear state. And the Prophet was, was disappointed. And so what happened was during the time when he was being stoned as his punishment, as his consequence, he started to run. He started to run. And the Prophet said, stop to all the people who were throwing. And there was one companion who, Allah knows best, he didn't hear the Prophet and he threw. And it was, a, it was a bone. This is how specific hadith science is. It was the bone of the shoulder of like an animal, like a lamb or a goat or something. Like someone, and it hit him right in the temple. And Allahu Akbar, he died on the spot from that hit. The Prophet ﷺ looked at that man and said, you killed him. He was gone. He was forgiven. He was going to go. Leave him alone. I said, stop. You killed him. And the Prophet ﷺ left. He walked away. He was upset. These are people who, in the community now, imagine someone just walked in, they're like, I committed zina. It's, uh, like, just throwing judgment down on this person, left and right. The Prophet him, he said, look, this is between you and Allah. Are you sure? Do you want to? Yes? Okay. And then at the first sign that this person wanted their tawbah to be just like, they wanted to still live, the Prophet said, stop, let them, let them have their, like, sort of, let them rebuild themselves. Let them, be, let them live. And the person didn't listen. He killed them. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was very upset with that companion. So how do, we, how do we interact with people who have made grave mistakes, horrible mistakes, but they want to they wanna recover? How do we interact with them? Do, do, is there any masjid in the country that has like AA programs? Is there any masjid in the country that, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not shaming masjids. I'm just saying like, do we think like this is a community? Is there any masjid that you know of? Yes or no? Start one. If not here, wherever you end up in your masjid, start one. If you can't, rent out a space. Start giving people spaces to recover. Start allowing people to build themselves back up. Right? This is the Muslim sunnah of the Prophet Wasallam. And even those people who actually not just made mistakes, but actually did not like the Prophet Wasallam, he had this incredible, incredible clemency with them that eventually they would come to accept the religion of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ would forgive them wholeheartedly. All you need to know about the Prophet ﷺ's forgiveness with how he socialized was that during the Battle of Uhud, which was one of the hardest days of his life, the architect of the battle itself, Khalid bin Walid, the woman who took the life of his uncle Hamza, Hind, and the assassin that she paid, Wahshi, those three individuals, we say after their name, may Allah be pleased with them because they accepted Islam, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi accepted them. This is who he was. I mean, if somebody like unfollows us on Instagram, we're like, never again will you have a glance from these eyes. You know, like, and the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi is dealing with somebody who took the life of his uncle and he's looking at him and you know what he says? He says, tell me how you did it. He's talking to Wahshi. Wahshi comes and wants to convert, and he says, Wahshi, tell me how you did it. And Wahshi tells me, he details to him how he killed his uncle in detail. He said, I was going in the battle, I was walking, I was looking for him. I'd been given this one specific mission, and I had a spear that was poisoned, and I found him, and I threw the spear at his, uh, at his, at his ab the back of his abdomen, his side. And the Prophet was crying, crying there the whole time. This is like his brother. Hamza is like his big brother. And after that, all is forgiven. Incredible. Incredible. I'm going to give one piece of advice and then we'll end it here. How do we enact being forgiving? Do we live in a time where people are doing some pretty horrible things? I think it's pretty clear. I don't think anyone disagrees. That not just men are trash, but I think a lot of people are trash, right? Okay. But we don't use statements like that because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
So I was using it to kind of set you up. <laughs> Just joking. I'm using it to show that we are hurt by these things. Is it okay to feel hurt? Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. It's okay to feel hurt. The Prophet Sallallahu felt hurt. He cried when Wahshi talked about how he killed his uncle. It is prophetic to feel hurt, but we don't stop being prophetic there. We continue the path of the Prophet Sallallahu and we try to give people paths to recovery. We do not shut them out and judge them before Allah has judged them. That doesn't mean that if somebody's a pedophile or a rapist or a sexual abuser, that we say, oh, it's forgiven. Come on. That's not how it works. But at the same time, we don't say, you are done. No one should look at you. Dig a ditch, jump in and cover yourself up and die. That's not how we treat anybody. If somebody is a racist and bigot and they come to me in the grocery store and say, I, w I hope you die. I hope that the Prophet doesn't went through much worse. And he never once raised his hands and said, oh Allah, Allahumma, lightning bolt, right? Like, <laughs> and they would have been destroyed. Like, you have to understand, he's the messenger of God. It, people went up to him and they, literally, they said to him like, you're shaitan, what did he bring you today? They used to literally come, when he, when he received revelation and he'd be teaching his companions, oh, what did your shaitan bring you today? What did he bring you today? This was how Hind was before she converted. This is how she was. She would go up to him and literally talk trash to his face over and over and over. And how did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam deal with her when she said, I want to become Muslim? Ahlan. Islam is a powerful religion because it forces us to transcend our humanity and to get close, as close as we can to the divinity. And part of that is that we allow for people to recover and we try to facilitate it while not muting our own pain. Because we're nuanced creatures. We're not one or the other. We're nuanced. I can feel, maybe that means I don't have to heal. That person maybe means I can refer them to find healing somewhere else. And I try to find my own journey of healing in that. Right? This is why you see these stories, man. You guys saw that the Ammu, the uncle from Kentucky, who embraced the murderer of his son? Before two years ago, I'd be like, cool, that's amazing, wow, Islam. Now with a son, I don't know if I could do it. Even accidentally, if someone took the life of Musa or hurt him, man, I see kids at Jimboree take toys and I'm like, watch yourself. <laughs> right, like, <laughs> like, literally, I'm like. And Musa kind of like trips them, I'm like, ha. I'm like, mm, cough, right? <laughs> Imagine like I, as a father of a two-year-old, I see somebody cut the line at Musa for cheese and crackers and my blood starts boiling. Can you imagine this father that this man shot his son? His son was a pizza delivery boy, uh, man and he shot him and killed him for no reason in cold blood. And this man in a courtroom is crying, hugging him, saying, I forgive you. Allahu Akbar, dude, that is Islam. It changes you, it makes you different. Like you're not who you were. You're just not who you were. Any other father would say, never, never. And he's like, no, Allah says we have to. Why? Because Allah knows better for me than what I know for myself. So we all have incredibly painful things that we're witnessing, that we're seeing. Okay, we can, we can just unplug the laptop. How about that? I think the fire thing was pretty cool for the first like 10 seconds. And then afterwards it was like, <laughs> we all have incredibly painful things that we're witnessing, that we're experiencing. I'm not here to tell you just... Make dua and pray, go away. It's no, 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 no. That's not how it works. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam never, never shut down someone's trauma. He would allow them to talk about it. He would allow them to process it. He'd give them time. He'd, heal, he'd help them in healing. But he would also never pronounce the other person judged before Allah had judged them. There were maybe precautions taken. There were. There were precautions taken. If someone had an inclination towards stealing, maybe they wouldn't be left near open market. No, seriously, I'm not joking. If a person had inclination toward alcohol, they would, be kept, they would be kept on watch. But that's all part of the healing process. And even if I can't do it for that person because they've hurt me too deep, I pray and hope that they can get their healing because they're sick. Like we all have our sicknesses. We ask Allah to heal us. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the ability to practice what we've said and heard. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people who socialize in his way. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us people of virtue and not vice. And to allow us to become people who are inspirations and that we do not indict but we invite.
We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to follow the path of his messenger and not the path of anyone else. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help us in all of our shortcomings and pardon us for our mistakes and sins, that which we know about and those which we don't know about. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give us the strength to follow the straight path and the strength to follow the example of his messenger, salam, and that he forgives us and gives us no hisab on the day of judgment and that we enter Jannah peacefully and directly. Amin ya Rabbil Alameen. Any questions? We'll take questions for like a minute. Because I know I went over time. I apologize. Anonymous question? Sure. Some of them are kind of Some of them are kind of heavy. <laughs> One person made fun of me. One person made fun of you? Yeah. All right. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Is the Qiyam still happening at 11.30? Can you tell them tomorrow? Uh, tomorrow, inshallah. Okay. <laughs> If you have family or friends who care for you deeply and they seem distant or like they care about somebody else more than you, how do you bridge the gap and bring them closer? What if you've done your part and reached out to them well, but it's not reciprocated? How do you find peace in your heart? SubhanAllah. Um, Safi, do you want to? So if you have family or friends who you care for deeply, but they seem distant and like they care about other people more than you, how do you try to bridge that gap and bring them closer? What if you've already done your part, but they are not reciprocating? And how do you make your heart feel at peace? You can start and then I'll add some stuff. Mm. So that's a really, that's a really difficult question for, and whoever asked that, I really, really, mashallah, that's an amazing thing to bring up. And that's a lot, that's a really brave question to bring up actually. Um, not, not being reciprocated, the love that we give out is actually never a good feeling, no matter who it is. Um, and in fact, it hurts that much more because as a family member, uh, do you guys agree that kind of like, you know, when family members kind of hurt you, it hurts a little bit more than when even like friends hurt you a little bit, because at the end of the day, when like a family member hurts you, you that's like the least of expectancy in terms of like being hurt. Okay. Like for example, I remember like when I was younger, whenever like my sisters chose to hang out with their friends over me, I would actually get like super, super like, like kind of like down i was like why um i know i'm like this like nerdy little like 13 year old daisy kid with a weird mustache but please <laughs> but uh but 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 of course absolutely For, so to kind of address that serious question though what i would say is that at the end of the day i personally think that communication is key i really do i think that a lot of things get left um unsaid because of some awkward, you know, like, you know, discomfort between the, these two people. If you have a family member that you feel that isn't reciprocating love that you give back to them and you feel like they're kind of prioritizing their friends over you or other parts of their social life over you, the first thing that you do is not get defensive. Not get defensive, right? First of all, getting defensive never heals anything personally. Whenever, even when I've made the mistake of getting defensive when I was like, kind of like growing up and getting older, I've always been like, but I do this for you and I do that for you and I do this for you and I took you here and I took you there. And remember when I was there, and like that never works. The number one thing that honestly works and, and, and that has actually worked for me whenever I have to have a, like a heart to heart with a person is to let them know that like, listen, like I love you. Just straight up tell them that. Just be like, I love you. And it hurts me that I feel that I'm not as much of a priority as for you as, you know, like a friend is for you. And I wish I was, right? Just being cutthroat honest. And at the end of the day, another thing that we have to think about is that even if a person is not doing their best as like a sibling or as a family member, that doesn't mean you kind of give, give it to them back. Your job is to be even like a better brother or even like a better sister. And oftentimes when we come to like these like sessions and mashallah was like on full roast mode tonight, he gets better as the night goes on. <laughs> um, but you know, we, th we kind of like think of all uh, automatically, we think of other people first, right? We're like, oh my God, he talked about backbiting. There should be so many people in this room right now. But very, very seldom do we ever think be like, man, what if that's kind of laying dormant in my heart? So always ask the question, be like, maybe did, did I not do something right? Maybe I should have actually like spent another hour with that person. Maybe they were hurt about something that I did. So always look inwards first, I think, for, first and foremost. And number two, and, and obviously being very honest with them, not getting defensive and not getting kind of like, you know, aggressive but just being very genuine with your heart and almost like exposing your weakness a little bit. Sometimes it hurts to tell somebody that you're hurt, right? You're like, I feel, I feel kind of sad. 
it's kind of like embarrassing for the ego, right? Because you don't want to like tell anybody that like you're 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 you know you're timid or something like that. But sometimes the best thing to do is actually lower your guard a little bit, showing that you're weak sometimes. Be like, man, that hurt me. And honestly, by showing our weakness, sometimes people learn through that by seeing your weakness. You know what I'm saying? So inshallah, I think those are like my, you know, from my little experience that I have, but I'm sure I saw other one can add on to that for sure. Yeah, so I think, um, oh, the paper clip's gone. Where'd it go? Oh, it's like way down there. Okay. Uh, so I, I think this is a really good question, obviously. I also think that sometimes the reality is that like these things take a long, long, long time, especially if you have been through something difficult in your life with this person or maybe you have like a not so uh, perfect relationship with your parents growing up. Uh, if you had a not so perfect relationship with your parents growing up, like sometimes those negative experiences can kind of like bring out the worst in relationships. And so I don't, um, I don't deny that they exist. I also think that it's important to understand that this is why the Quran talks about every kind of family relationship. So the Quran doesn't just tell us about like the, you know, the, the, the sing, you know, the, the single family home with like wife and a husband and two and a half kids. That statistic always weirds me out, by the way. Two and a half kids is like strange. Uh, like they share it with the neighbor. And so, uh, and, and, and like the white picket fence or whatever, uh, even the fence is white. And so, um, and so anyways, I, th I think it's important to know that like Islam teaches us about like Ibrahim salam who had issues with his father, about Yusuf who had issues with his brother, about Lut who had issues with his daughters, right? Like these are the things that you find in the Quran, the Quran is so relevant. It's so powerful. Like you're reading a story and you're like, wow, that's exactly how life is. Like I just had an argument with somebody over this. Like my, my siblings and I didn't get along. They didn't leave me in a well to die, but they don't like me. They probably would if they could, like, you know, if it gets that serious. And by the way, the sister that I talked about in the beginning, who she said my brother didn't come to my wedding and does, has never met my son, his nephew, I told her, read Surah Yusuf, because it's the greatest way to talk, to, to, to go through and, and learn about how the Quran addresses, like, family issues. So try your best. That's all you can do. When it comes to socializing and relationships, all you can do is your best. And you have to identify that. You have to know, like, I can't give more of you than I have, Right? Uh, the Arabic, you know, the Arabic saying, they say, that like the one who doesn't have can't give. So you have to make sure that you are like, okay, internally, and then you give what you can. And then after that, halas, like you can't give anything more. And at that point, you might just need to let it have some time, kind of marinate, right? But just because they don't call you an Eid doesn't mean you're like, you know what, I'm not going to call them an Eid either. Or I'm not going to do... You always try to be the better person. That's how the Prophet ﷺ handled these situations generally. Uh, another question was, how do you get to know somebody in a halal way? Um, <laughs> 19th, 80. Oh. So, so, this is a good question. <coughs> Everyone's talking because they're like, that was me, right? Uh, <laughs> By the way, every time the lights go out, I totally think Stranger Things, like, right away. I'm like, they're coming. So how do you get to know someone in way? Yep. I'm going to give you the quick rundown, okay? Number one is that you make sure that you understand even what you're looking for. And I think a lot of people kind of walk into this uh, arena of, like, their life, like, not sure and not knowing. And it's true that you will discover and learn things on the way but the reality is the reality is that you have to do some self-preparation first and what i mean by that is like i don't care like what kind of music you like or they like that's irrelevant i don't care if like you like biryani and they like you know kepsa that's irrelevant what i mean is like do you guys align on values like do you both think that prayer is important do you both think that like at some point you want to make hajj? Do you both think that like Allah is God? These are questions that are really powerful and important because the problem is everything you do from your marriage starts on a trajectory. And even though you start off very, very close, if the trajectory is even one or two degrees off, what happens like down the line? Look at the, I mean, just chart it out, just graph it out, right? Starts off very close. And as life gets longer and longer together, it starts getting further and further, okay? So you have to make sure that your trajectory that the degrees are as close as possible, right? Not your academic degrees, right? You're like PhD, MD, we're good. Like, 
Parents will be so proud. I'm talking about like who you are as a person, okay? And your values, like do you believe in like, are you a very family oriented person? Like if you're a very family oriented person and like you really believe in family gatherings and keeping the family unit together and visiting often and the other person is not so much that way, then you might have issues because they just won't see the value in going to your parents' house for dinner, right? During your break, like they just won't see it. So, and again, it's not saying that a person's bad or good. What it is saying though, is that you just have to make, that your, make sure that your values are aligned. So I would recommend doing like a value assessment, like what kind of person are you? Like an individual's value assessment. I'd recommend doing the love languages quiz, <laughs> right? Okay, and I'd recommend going through premarital counseling, even individually. There's a questionnaire that, that, that has been developed and, and used and reused that teaches you a lot about yourself. I once was doing a nikah, and this is why I don't do this stuff anymore. Uh, <laughs> I once was doing a nikah, and I do nikahs. There's one last one, right? No, you guys are already nikahed. I do show up to shadis uh, <laughs> for the food. The cupcakes again. Uh, so... I was doing a nikah where the day of the nikah, the day, they, they basically like forced it and I was like, no, 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 I'm not, I'm not going to do it. And they were like, no, no, you have to, please. And I was like, no, why? And they were like, I was like, just find another imam of the community. And they were like, you are the imam of the community. I was like, oh, good, good point. Uh, <laughs> so I was like, all right. So I have a rule that whoever does nikah with me or who did a nikah with me, past tense, right? Uh, they had to go through premarital counseling with me. And it was like a five hour thing. We'd meet once a week for five, uh, once once a week for one hour each time for five weeks. And the questions were really good, the conversation was really good, and this, this couple, I should have known, they kind of just like, they just never showed up to the meetings. But obviously I'm not gonna be like, no nikah for you, because like the whole family's flying in from like Karachi and stuff, so I'm like, I just make it happen. <laughs> so on the day of, I circled, so what I do is you answer the questionnaire individually and I circle areas of strength and areas of concern based on your answers that you've individually done. I compare them and I circle like, okay, this is a really good thing, y'all should work, y'all should like really highlight this. You guys, mashallah, are like really compatible in this. And then there's some where I'm like, okay, you two are basically the opposite, okay? Like you're Harry, you're Voldemort, like this is a problem. <laughs> like this isn't gonna work, all right? So, and I'm like, we gotta figure this out before you guys do this or this, this, whatever. So one of the things that was like really, really problematic, and some of you might laugh, but it was like a serious thing, is, um, their understanding of disciplining children. And one of them was like gung-ho about physical discipline. And one of them was like, not at all, okay? Basically the wife was not and the husband was. Uh, someone said, of course, all right? But the, the reality, actually the husband actually, to kind of like throw off your stereotypes a little bit, the husband had actually been a recent white convert to Islam and the wife was uh, uh, a Southeast Asian, Indian, Pakistani, Bengali girl. So like, she was the one who grew up with it and she was like, never. Like, we're never gonna do this. And he was like, I mean, I heard it works, right? <laughs> so he was like really gung-ho with it, which by the way, all data shows that physical discipline do not, does not work at all. All data shows that. Just be a better parent, just be st have stamina, just don't hit your kids. Uh, so, I was talking to them about it, and dude, it was like an hour before their nikah, and they were like, they were like in tears, because they could not reconcile this. I was like, okay, can we at least agree that you're not gonna have kids until we can reconcile this. And then he was like, I mean, I don't know why I should have to, I'm like, okay, like, he's like, I don't know why I should have to wait to have kids, like, I don't understand, like, I wanna have kids, like, what? I was like, because you guys do not agree on something. And then finally I was like, I'm not gonna do this nikah until you agree. I was like, all your, uh, the entire population of Karachi can just sit there and wait, right? <laughs> I was like, I'm just not gonna do it. So then finally, and I was kind of like, I have to be objective in these conversations, of course, but, you know, desperate times. So I was like, look, just don't do it. And I was like, show me one hadith where the Prophet saw some hit his kid. And he was like, I can't. And I was like, exactly, you're not going to hit kids. And so we moved on. But the point being was, if you don't do that stuff early on, then like imagine, and this is how a lot of marital issues happen. So first step, find your own values. Number two, do not look for the superficial dumb things when you're looking for marriage. I get it, he's cute, I get it, she's beautiful, like I understand. But are you gonna be still married to them if they are not this way? If something happens, Allah somehow Allah, may Allah protect us, are you gonna be the person that helps them clean their bedpan and feeds them food? Like are you gonna be that person? If not, don't marry them. 
Just, just don't. Okay. So make sure that you love them deeply, not what they look like because things change. Okay. Uh, and that's know what you're looking for. And the third thing is once you have solidified yourself as a whole person and you found someone that you think is another whole person and you like them for the right reasons, you like them for their tweets, not for their Instagram pictures. Okay. That's the way that you got to think about it. Okay. You like them for their thoughts, not for their body. Okay. Uh, or their, or, or like their medium.com blog account and not their Snapchat. Once you find somebody in that situation, then I recommend, I recommend that you try to get to know each other through a third party. Uh, if it's too scary to bring it up to your parents right away, I can sympathize with that. But at the same time, just understand that the reason why that whole protocol exists is so that you don't get hurt. Okay, so if you're going to if you're go, if you're going to choose to supersede that protocol, then be prepared to potentially cry a lot. It's just what happens. The whole idea behind why is a lot. It's not like a law is like you have to tell your father because I don't want you to have fun. Like that's not what Islam is about. <laughs> Islam is like you have to involve family so that neither of you hurt one another, because relationships without commitment is like a grenade once the pin's pulled. Like it's only a matter of time. And so you have to really be careful about making sure that you involve third parties. Family is best. If for some reason you cannot involve family, then this is where like community elders, imams, uh, people in the community that you can trust that are kind of like, you know, like community elders, right? Like you have the auntie or uncle in the community that's like cool. You know, they're like really cool, right? Like at like the Super Bowl party, they're all over there watching cricket and like they're the one that's watching the game with you. Like that one, that, that elder. They can help you. And then inshallah, eventually graduate to telling your families and move forward from there. What I would definitely not recommend, these are red flags, do not spend time alone. Do not spend time alone. Do not spend time alone. Why? Because there is something we believe in Islam called barakah. We all want to have a relationship that has barakah, which is blessings, yes or no? Yes. Blessings are things that keep things going. If your food has blessing in it, you don't need as much food to get full. Okay, if your car has blessing in it, you don't need to take as much gas to get to where you're going. Like, there's just barakah, it just lasts forever, okay? So, when I do things against Islam, it takes barakah away from it. It's like poking a hole in a vessel. It's just dripping barakah, it's leaving. Okay, I want to make sure I keep as much of that in there as I can. So that when I do get married, the barakah will smooth over any difficulties. The fight that would have ended in horrible angry, hurt feelings, because we have barakah, Allah has given us the strength to smooth things over very quickly. So make sure that your priority number one is barakah. You will have, there will come a time when you can tell this person everything about you, how you feel, you can show them how you feel, you can physically interact and show how you feel. There will come a time, it's just not now, All right? So if we can have a little bit of patience in these moments leading up to that day, then wallahi, I'm promising you, that the marriage for the rest of your life will be so, inshallah, 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 full of barakah and incredible, right? We ask Allah to, to help us, inshallah. And I, I get it, it's tough. I totally get it. Like, you're tell I had to fight for two years to marry my wife. For two years. Oh, man, I got to tell you the story. <laughs> when I met his parents, they met, okay. <laughs> yeah, my brother. He knows. They met me to tell me no. Like they were like, they were like, you're 18, because that's when I proposed. And they were like, she, and they're like, you're 18, N no. And I was like, <laughs> I was like, we're getting married. I was literally like, we're getting married, so like, get on board so we can figure this out together. Like these things work better when we're all team, right? And so I was like, you know, <laughs> he's laughing. <laughs> And, and, and the reason why I'm telling you this is because like, I'm not sitting here as the guy on the couch who like had it super easy. It was really difficult. There was a lot of tears. There was a lot of tears, right? On both sides. Uh, but we stuck it out. Alhamdulillah. And now this is our 11th year, right? Alhamdulillah. So we married. So inshallah, it's okay. I don't need, that. I don't do it for the odds. I appreciate the odds. I don't do it for the odds. You had a question? Yeah. Well, I was going to ask, what are your thoughts on dating? Because now mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Are, are you Zach's sister? Yeah. Sound like him, by the way. Mashallah. I feel like you're my sister now, because Zach's like my brother. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mashallah. Zach, he's a good brother, my mashallah. Alhamdulillah. Uh, I'm trying to get to his gain status uh, one day. Mashallah. Seems like Zach's a popular guy. But, uh, okay. So, uh, what's your name? Yasmin. Yasmin. Okay. All right, Yasmin. 
That's a very good question. Like, what, what are my thoughts on dating? Because it just seems like everyone's just dating and it's just so normal. And then on the other side of it, like there is a functional, practical reason to it. Like there is a portion where you have to get to know somebody. So remember the stage where I said to try to like involve a third party? I never say, and I actually tell people, don't call someone your boyfriend or your girlfriend. Because, and I actually, by the way, I'm coaching someone through this stage like right now. Uh, they're very close to me and I'm coaching them through it. And I said, don't call them your boyfriend or your girlfriend. They said, why? I said, because there are certain definitions and connotations to that label that might cause a, a deviation in expectations. So maybe they think that you're more, they think. So I said, just say you're talking to somebody, right? Or even that you're seeing somebody, right? Islamically, totally okay. Why? Because the parameters are different. So in Islam, dating as we know it commonly is not okay, where it involves like maybe going out alone and privacy, maybe like physical touch. But the idea of spending time going out to dinner with somebody, talking to them, going to see a movie, going bowling, like having those, those coffee dates on weekend mornings, that is actually totally, not only Islamically allowed, but encouraged. In fact, if two people walked in here right now and they were like, you know, a beard and a hijab just walked in here right now. <laughs> and they were like, we've never seen each other. We just want to get married. I'd be like, absolutely not. This happened to the Prophet Sallallahu Someone went up to him and said, Ya Rasulullah, I want to marry this woman. He said, have you seen her? She said, he said, no. And he thought that his answer no was like going to be impressive. Like, I don't need to see her. She's a Sahabia, right? Like, <laughs> That's, and he thought, no, he really thought. And the Prophet said, go look at her. Like you, go look at her. Why? He's like, because I don't want to deal with this later where you're like, I didn't know her, right? So the point being is, I fully, fully support people getting to know each other. Just make sure that there's a, a few protocol, right? And the protocol, try your best, 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 best not to be alone. Uh, public gathering, if you can like double date, triple date, group date, you know those ones, like, all you guys do it now, they got like 3,000 friends, like, right? So just go out with that person, get to know them there, y'all can sit and talk as you're waiting for your turns bowling, or as you're waiting for your food, or as you order coffee, you can like, you know, those kinds of things, that's totally fine, just make sure that you try your best, try your best not to like physically touch, just try your best, again, because that buttock is very important, and then once you guys have spent enough time in those very, very blessed meetups where it's like not haram, right? Then once you guys are like, you know what? I think this is working out. Let's take it to the next stage, which is let's involve our parents. But I do not, not, not recommend people skip that stage. You have to go get coffee together. You have to go see a movie. You have to go get dinner because that's like application of this relationship. Like what's, what's the deal here? But you have to do it in groups where there's responsible people present and it has to be known basically. It has to be public. Right? It can't be like this hidden thing. Um, and again, the reason why? F merely for all of our protection. For all of our protection. I told you all the story at Roots, but I, I didn't tell it in Austin. About the brother in, in the city that I used to live in where he was dating this girl for a long time, two years, I think. And uh, she dumped him. And he, he came to me crying. He said, now I, know it's, now I know why it's haram. But he said, you told me for two years... I didn't go up to him and was like, it's haram, it's haram. I always, when I saw him, I'd be like, hey, how's she doing? He's like, good. I'd be like, let me, let me know. My, my way of doing it is like, let me know when you guys want me to get me involved. Kind of like, let's, let's turn this from haram to halal, right? Like, you know, like Jesus water into, okay. So I was like, <laughs> we can turn this from haram to halal very quickly, right? Inshallah. And so he, he came to me at the very end of the relationship. He goes, Ustad, I know now why you said it was haram. He goes, this hurts. It sucks. And he was like, he wasn't eating, he was failing his classes. It was really bad. It was really bad. And you know what? That's not an abnormal story. It's not an abnormal story. So Allah just wants to make sure that our hearts are whole when we meet somebody. And so he's like, just do it the right way. And if it doesn't work out even in the right way, then the pain and the damage is minimized. It's minimized. Right? I know it's tough, y'all. I know it's not easy. Trust me. Trust me on that. Okay? One last question, inshallah. Thanks for asking this me. Yeah. Back to the story of Washi. Um, yeah. The Prophet, uh, to, to my understanding, when, when I read the narration, maybe correct me. Yeah. When he had Washi, he told him that don't stand in front of me, I can't look at you. Yeah. yeah that's actually a ziyada from. The, the yeah. Wisdom behind that, that sometimes there are you know, even brothers in Islam, sisters in Islam, that distance. 
So, so actually, I looked into this because this was a very confusing. So, you guys remember the story of Wahshi? He, he assassinated the uncle of the Prophet. I, I looked into this because I read this narration, I was reading it with my teachers, and uh, it, it didn't sound like the Prophet. It didn't sound like him. Like, I couldn't imagine this. And by the way, that is not a good way to judge things by. Right? This is actually something that some hadith scholars talk about. It sort of becomes a thing when you start to read hadith a lot. You know, like, you know, like if, 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 uh, if Safi came to me and he's like, hey, uh, Amu, which means mom in, in Bangla, basically. If he was like, Amu said this, like, I would only know, I would only have a gut feeling based on that. Why? Because I've been her son-in-law for 11 years. And not only that, but Bengali son-in-laws are like, uh, like amazing, right? Like every time I go to Memphis, like an animal has to die, basically, right? Because they roast it. So if Safi said like, hey, Amu said this, I would be able to, like, based on the surface level assessment, I'd be able to understand quickly, like, did she, do I think she actually said that or not, right? So some hadith scholars say that when you become a student of hadith to a certain extent, you start to read hadith nonstop, nonstop, you're reading books and books, like thousands of hadith a week, basically. And he said that, they say that you begin to develop what, like a relationship, a familiarity with the Prophet Sallallahu where like you can start to sort of pick out things. Now again, some of the things are really easy and really general. Like some of y'all might be able to pick out fabrications even if we did it right now, right? Because again, mashallah, you love the Prophet Sallallahu But there are certain sciences to this where like they pick out like syllables. They're like, no, 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 he would have said it this way. And then when you go back in the books, back, 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 you find out in fact it was a mistake, right? So again, very surface level. I'm not like a savant. I just said to myself like, Sheikh, this isn't, this doesn't really like jive with the Prophet Sallallahu that I read about, that I know. Where he would tell a guy, you can become Muslim, everything you did before this was forgiven, but by the way, because you killed my uncle, don't, 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 look, don't stand in front of me because I can't look at you. Even though it's a really nice sort of like, oh, he's human, look at this. So we went back, we looked back and we looked back, we read on it, and it, do, it, it, it appears to be a ziyada, an addition of how the storytellers would talk about this narration, that it wasn't actually from the hadith itself, but it was like, you know how I kind of am telling the story in a way that's kind of a little bit obviously palatable because the hadith itself, which is permissible by the way, but they would add this. So I don't add anything like this that would change the meaning of it. But this is an addition. This is ziyada. Wallahu ta'ala adam. Why? And why is that even more powerful than the other one? Because it shows that you can emotionally choose Allah over yourself. Like, you can do it. With tears streaming down your face, you can say, Allah, not me. And that submission is powerful. Right? My Lord is greater than me. Even in this moment, you took my uncle from me, you killed him, but you're my brother now. My Lord is greater than me. It's tough. It's not, it's not easy. But that's the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So yeah, so that's kind of a, I'm happy you brought that up. It's obviously, and inshallah, as you study more and more, then we'll be able to sort of get, uh, get our bearings on that, inshallah. Okay, I'll wrap up. Barakallahu everybody.